morning, everyone. It's good, good to morning. see you all. Beautiful morning. Um, before we get started, I'd like to welcome all the visitors. And I hope all of you got a bulletin. We have this little handy dandy sheet right here called the lapel. Jamie taught me that little term. Uh, on the lapel of the bulletin, there is a sheet there. You can write your name. We'd like to ask you if you're visiting, if you'd write your name on that. Uh, check any of the appropriate boxes that you want to fill in. Pull it off. Put it in the offering plate as it's passed, which will happen shortly, so you kind of need to do that right away. Also, if you have a prayer request, a need, or anything like that, any of you would like to put on that, do the same thing with it and put it in the bulletin. Also, you will notice that at the end of the pews, the red book is back. So if you would pass that down, uh, take a look at who's in the, in the pew with you, and read them, and sign your name, and we'll, that'll give us a record of attendance. Um, and uh, on the little tear-off sheet, if, if you're not a visitor, you want to tear that off, take it home, put it on your refrigerator so you remember to pray for those people, that would be a good idea too. Uh, anniversaries this week. We have one anniversary. John and Joyce calls coming up this week. On the 24th, right, John? Okay. And then we have one birthday on the 21st is Peyton Blackwood. Activities uh, kind of winding down a little bit for the summer. Wednesday at 9.30 is Ladies' Prayer. Circle J is over with. A choir will not practice this Wednesday night. The Kansas Baby Bottle Project is in process. There, if you don't have a bottle yet, there's some bottles back in the back. There's some bottles back by the uh, office. You're welcome to grab one, fill it up with your coins, and return it on Father's Day, June 18th. There are opportunities to serve. You can sign up for those on the sheets back by the office, um, nursery, children's worship. Um, we'll be, we're looking for VBS volunteers to help. Uh, to teach, to do different things there. There's other opportunities, but you can you can check on, on that sheet or you can check with the office. Then Sunday school, we'll have a new Sunday school class beginning June the 4th, uh, led by Pastor John and Karen. It'll be for age groups 20, 30, 40 years old. So uh, if you would like to do that, feel lead to be a part of that. It'll be a good, good class. Uh, that will begin June the 4th. It'll be upstairs. So it'll be upstairs uh, next to the prayer room, I believe. So if you're wandering around up there thinking you're lost, just pop in one room. Someone will get you the right spot. Um, then also, uh, on June the 6th, beginning on Tuesday, June the 6th, uh, Karen will be leading a Bible study at either 10 a.m. or 7 p.m. at the Parsonage. So if you'd like to be a part of that, let Karen know so that she kind of knows how many to plan for and that kind of thing. Then put this on your calendar, if you would please, as kind of a save the date. On July 16th through the 19th will be BBS. So if you have children uh, that age, uh, kind of get them prepared for that. Also, we are looking for teachers, helpers to help with that, any other things, snacks and things that go along with BBS. So if you'd like to serve in that way, there's lots of opportunity there. Any other announcements that need to be made that... Okay, so uh, let's have our memory verse for, for, for the children in the Sunday school us as well, which comes out of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, and let's say that with them. It says, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Now if the ushers would come forward, please. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we, we come to you this morning. We assemble in your house to honor and worship you. We raise our prayers 
and our praise to you, declaring to the world that we are your followers, your disciples. We ask you to be present in our worship this morning. Touch our, touch our minds, touch our hearts, and touch our souls. We ask that the words you speak through Pastor John comfort us, make us uneasy, excite us, and drive us to walk in a closer step with you. Now as we receive these tithes and offerings, we are so blessed by your gifts and we return a small portion of these to you. We ask that you can continue to bless and to guide us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand as you're able, we'll sing our opening song of worship. In this, day. this is a prayer to God. We're talking to God, and praising Him.
scripture this morning is out of the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in, in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. If you may be seated, please. And we'll have special music this morning by John. I know it says uh, John and Joyce on there. And uh, Mike just, you know, she's on the prayer list. And she's doing actually pretty good overall, but she keeps having a little bit of problems with the toe that started everything a couple months ago. And so it was infected again. So she had to take more antibiotics. And so she's having a few side effects on that. So anyway, she's tired of taking antibiotics. <laughs> But this song is kind of hopefully leading into uh, what Pastor John's going to talk about today. Because people do need the Lord.
and Son. Now if you take your hymnal, turn to page 104, or give your attention to the screen, we'll sing, O oh, Worship the King, verses 1, 2, and 5, and we are here to worship our King. There are millions and millions and millions of reasons to do that. Not one, not two. So, let's join in song. <laughs> Well, 
Well, good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. All right. Well, a couple prayer requests. Uh, pray for, uh, continue to pray for Danny. Uh, he's getting the cattle prod, I mean, the stimulator adjusted in his in his back uh, this week at KU, and hopefully they'll get that taken care of. Uh, thank the Lord for the rain, but we need some more, and so continue to pray for that. And uh, we just continue to pray that God would use us and mold us into His image. Father in heaven, we come to you now, and we just thank you and praise you for the wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you, to love you, to know you. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with Danny as, as, as he is uh, still down on the back. Lord, I just pray that the doctors will know exactly what to do to fix that. And Lord, if not, I pray that you'll just fix it. And Lord, we just trust in you for that. Lord, we continue to thank you for the rain, but we, Lord, we ask for uh, more uh, to fill up these ponds around here for, for the livestock and and just continue to pray that you will open our hearts and, and help us to draw closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, if you'll take out your bulletin insert this morning, today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, not that, that everything I do is the norm anyway, but uh, we're going we're gonna, to, uh, it's going to be a little bit more teaching than preaching. And I want you to uh, be able to take notes if you would like to. Uh, and so... The title of the sermon is, is how, to, how to Lead Someone to Christ. And that is probably, probably one of the biggest, um, um, how do I say it, the biggest thing lacking in Christianity today is the average person not knowing how to actually take the Bible, how to lead someone to Christ. And uh, I just think that's a shame because we are, there's only two reasons for us to be, remain on this earth. One is to glorify the Lord and one is to lead people to Christ. And so we, uh, we have a tremendous opportunity this morning to learn how to do that. This is not the way, okay? This is not the way to lead someone to Christ, but it is a way. It's a way that I've developed uh, that will help you to simply use your testimony as to how to open up a conversation and help you to share Christ with those around us. So we're going to kind of delve right into it. And, uh, you know, up in, up north, uh, they do what's called, uh, in the wintertime, called ice fishing. Now, has anybody ever ice fished before? Okay. You have? Okay. I, I would expect that of you. I really <laughs> would. Okay. Because it just doesn't seem fun to me. I mean, sitting out on a frozen lake, uh, but it just doesn't seem fun to me. But in order to get to the fish, in order to get to the fish, how do you have to, what do you have to do? You have to break the ice, okay? You have to break the ice. And, and for, for us as believers in Christ, if we're going to share Christ, if we're going to share the love of Jesus with those around us, we kind of have to break the ice, don't we? We have to kind of get the conversation started. We have to uh, help people to understand who we are and what we're about. And so uh, I'm going to help you to remember how to break the ice with somebody by uh, sharing uh, three simple steps, ICE, I-C-E, okay? If you remember I-C-E, you can remember how to share Christ with someone, okay? The first is initiate the conversation, initiate the conversation. So write that word wherever you see a blank, initiate is I, Okay, because we want to get a conversation going. Now, most people do not get saved just simply by hearing a revelation from God or, um, or um, not even generally in church. Most of the times they get saved by the witness of someone else. And so in order to do that, we need to initiate or start the conversation. How many of you have ever woken up today and said, you know, today's the day I want to lead someone to Christ, today? It usually doesn't work that way, does it? Unless you are intentional about it. And I think that we need to be more intentional about it, say, you know, Lord, help me today. Help me today to look for someone who needs Christ. Okay? 
And so if you're intentional about that, if you're intentional about your prayers, if you're intentional about uh, looking generally for looking for someone to, that desperately needs to know Christ, then you're all going to be ready. But we have to look for ways, point A, look for ways to bring Jesus into the conversation. Now, a lot of times people will bring Jesus into the conversation naturally if we're paying attention. Okay? Somebody may say, oh, Jesus. And it's not necessarily in a prayerful or a praiseworthy kind of conversation. But a lot of times people will bring uh, Jesus into the conversation or heaven or hell or all kinds of different ways. And if we are intentional about our desire to lead someone to Christ that day, maybe we'll pay a little bit more attention to when somebody brings up the conversation. But if, we do, if someone hasn't bring, brought up the conversation, we have to be intentional about looking for them. So the first thing you must do is open your eyes. Open your eyes. Psalms chapter 119 verse 136 says, My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. You know that song John sang about people need the Lord. It's absolutely true. That people are desperately looking, whether they know it or not, they're desperately looking for happiness, they're desperately looking for something to fill that emptiness in their heart. And we have to open our eyes and look around and see those people. You know, and you may not know them, or you may know them, and you may not realize that they are seeking for the Lord. So we have to open our eyes. The next step is we have to open our ears. We have to pay attention to what people are saying and how people are reacting to life and and the things that they come up in everyday conversation, open our ears to, to realize that people are hurting, and they are desperately hurting. Uh, Psalms 130 verse 2 says, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. And people are looking for pleas. They're looking for love. They're looking for joy and happiness in their life. And if we just open our ears, we'll realize that it is a cry for help, whether they realize it or not. And then the next thing is we must open our heart. We must open our heart. Do we care that people are lost and going to hell? Do we care that people around us in our community are hurting? Do we care that people desperately need Jesus? We've got to open our hearts. And if we don't open our hearts, we're never going to share Christ with them, are we? And so it says... In Psalms 40, verse 10, says, I have hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have, con I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from a great congregation. So we've got to, if we're going to share Christ with someone, we've got to open our eyes. We've got to look around and see that people are hurting. People are desperate. People are needy of Christ. We've got to open our ears. That their conversation, their speech, their, their attitudes, the things that they talk about daily is down, depressing, uh, in, in a world of hurt, a world of need. And we've got to open our heart and be really ready to share Christ with someone. Okay? Now, when uh, my dad lives on Lake Ozark, Missouri, okay? And uh, he has a really nice house on the lake. It's got a beautiful view of the lake. And I was at his house one time, and I said, Dad, if I was to get in a boat and go from one side to the other, just across your way, as far as I could see, those, those houses I see over there, and it literally probably wasn't uh, further than the courthouse from, from where we were, okay? He said, oh, it'd take you two or three minutes to get across the lake, that side, with my boat. And I said, well, what would happen if, if I had to get my car and drive around? He said, that would take you 45 minutes to an hour to get to that side of the lake. Because it winds around, you know, and finally it gets around. And so then I went down there a couple of years later, and they had built a bridge, okay? They built a bridge from one side of the lake to the other. And instead of now taking 45 minutes to get all the way around to the other side of the, of the lake, it now only took 10 minutes, okay? So we're going to build a bridge here to help people, uh, uh, to stimulate the conversation, to help people uh, turn the conversation 
around to Jesus. Okay? It just gets us there a little bit quicker, doesn't it? Okay? So that's what a bridge statement will do. It'll get us there a little bit quicker. So we've opened our eyes, we've opened our ears, we've opened our heart, and we're ready to share with someone about Jesus Christ if they're willing to listen. And so you may be in conversation with somebody. You may be talking about the weather, or you may be talking about the state of the economy, or you may be talking about politics, or you may be talking about someone who's sick or someone who's dying. It may be whatever conversation it may be, but I want you to make a transition to say this. I know what you're going through. I know what you're going through. Because what you've done at this point, you've got them on the same road that you're on. Okay? We're going to take them, instead of beating around the bush and taking a long time to get to the gospel, we're going to get there 10 minutes quicker. Right? And so we're going to help you to turn the conversation around from the weather or politics or someone who's sick in, in the hospital to the conversation about Jesus. And so this is a transition to get them there. It says the first transition is, I know what you're going through. Now, you need to use your relationship to Christ to relate to their situation. Use your relationship to Christ to relate to their situation. And we do that in several ways. Just several little statements. This is uh, one or two statements that can be used to help you to do that. It says, maybe you're talking about a problem or a death in the family or whatever, and you say, you've gone through that transition, you say, I know what you're going through, and then you say, I'm glad I have someone to go to when I have those kind of problems. Now you've taken them down a road that they don't even realize they're on yet. Okay? But you're trying to turn the conversation to Jesus. And all you need to say is, they're talking about complaining or griping about the, you know, whatever. And you say, you know what? I'm so glad I have someone to go to when I have those kind of problems. Now, what is the natural question that that person may ask? What is, if you said, I'm so glad I have someone to go to when I have, have those kind of problems, what's the natural question? Who? Who? Who's that person? Well, they just stepped right into that road that you wanted them to go on, didn't it? Okay? So you're stepping that road. They're going with you. They're taking down this road whether they realize it or not. Okay? So the natural question is, uh, I, I, I'm so glad I have someone to go through those problems. The next one is, you know, I can relate to that because God has taken me through that same kind of situation. I can relate because God has taken me through that same kind of situation. What's the natural question? What's the natural question? How? How? How has God taken you? Well, let me tell you how, okay? I can tell you how. And so, the, ne uh, the next, so you're going to take another bridge. We've got them down the same road now, aren't we? We're on the same road. We're heading toward Jesus. But we're going to take another shortcut, another transition, and it's this. Can I tell you a true story about my life? Can I tell you a true story about my life? Now, how many of you love to go to movies where the story is true? Okay? Why do we like to do that? Because we can relate, can't we? We can relate to the story that is true. And it, and, and it makes it a little more interesting because that's somebody that I can identify with, I can uh, relate to. Okay? So, can I tell you a true story? Now, let me ask you a question. Is that offensive if I ask you to tell me a story about my life? No, it's not offensive because I'm talking about my life. I'm not talking about what you need yet. We're going to get there. But I'm not talking about your life. I'm talking about my life. Now, the worst thing they can do is say, nope. That'd be interesting. Okay. And you know what? It's okay. 
You know, 95% of all people that hear about Christ the first time reject Him. You know? You've already eliminated half the battle right there. But So can I tell you a true story about my life? Absolutely. Okay? Because I'm talking about me now. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Okay? So I stands for what? I stands for what? Initiate the conversation. C stands for convey your testimony. Convey your testimony. Now, your testimony should include several things. Your testimony should include several things. The first one is where and when you got saved. Where and when you got saved. Okay? The second thing is why you received Christ. Why you received Christ. It's important to know why. And the third is what were the results of that commitment? What were the results of that commitment? Now we're going to go back to that in just a second. But uh, I'm going to share just real quickly, real briefly, my testimony. So I may be sharing with someone, can I tell you a true story about my life? You know, when I was uh, seven years old, my mom took me to a large youth meeting. And there, there was a movie talking about what would happen, what the Bible says will happen, that to those that are left behind when Christ comes and takes all the believers to heaven. And it scared the bejeebers out of me. Now, that's a word, right? That's, that's a Kansas word, isn't it? Bejeebers. Y'all understand what that word means? Okay. Okay. It scared the bejeebers out of me. I mean, I was scared to death. I didn't want to go to hell. As a seven-year-old boy, I didn't want to uh, be left behind. So, where were you when you got saved? I was at this big youth meeting, and my mom, afterwards, my mom uh, and I talked, and she led me to the Lord. Why you received Christ? I didn't want to go to hell. Now, I think that's a pretty good reason. Amen. I think that's a pretty good reason not to, not to want to go to hell in order to get saved. And what were the results of that decision? You know, now I don't fear about where I'm going to go. Now I don't worry about what tomorrow brings. Now I don't worry about the things, the bad things that are happening in this world because I have Christ in my heart. Amen. Now see, that was my testimony. That wasn't yours. Yours may be a little different. But that was my testimony of where I got saved, why I got saved, and what were the results. Okay? And it happened in about 30 seconds. All right? So, you, sh you conveyed your testimony. Once again, it's not offensive because it's your testimony. It's how you came to know Christ. Okay? But as we're walking down this road together, we're about ready to come to another bridge. Okay? And this bridge is another transition that would say, would you like to know how you can have that kind of relationship with Jesus? Now, once again, they may not be ready. But you know what? You planted the seed. You shared your testimony with them. You shared how you came to know Christ. And you're giving them an opportunity to come to know Christ. Would you like to know how you can have that kind of relationship with Jesus? What kind of relationship? Uh, a relationship where I don't worry about where I'm going to go if I were to die. I don't worry about the, the things about tomorrow because I know that God's got my heart and God's got my life. Okay? And generally, more often than not, people would say, well, yeah, I would like to know about that kind of relationship. So... I stands for what? Initiate the conversation. C stands for what? Convey your testimony. E stands for evangelize. Evangelize. I-C-E. I-C-E. Initiate the conversation, convey your testimony, and then evangelize. Now, this is where most people get hung up. Most believers, okay? Because they say, well, I don't know what to say. Or I don't know what to do. And I'm going to give you four verses, or five verses, that will simply lay out the truth of the gospel. How they can have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? So the first point is, all men are lost. Okay? 
all men are lost. So if I was if I was sharing this kind of relationship or sharing this conversation, I'd share my testimony about how I came to know Christ. I'd share that now I have a personal relationship with Him, and I would say, uh, "Would you like to know how you can have that kind of relationship with Jesus Christ?" And they may go, "Well, yeah." Well, see, the Bible says all men are lost. And we're going to turn to Romans 3.23. Now, I encourage you to memorize these five verses because you're not always going to have a scripture. Thank God for phones where we can pull them up and look at them and all that. But, uh, but I encourage you to memorize these verses. Uh, and if you can't memorize them, my wife, she marks the first one and, and then the next one she marks where the next one is. And so she has it down. Okay? It's okay. Whatever it takes. But I encourage you to memorize these verses. So all men are lost, the Bible says. Now, as a believer in Christ, you've got to realize that some people have never heard these verses before. They've never been in church. I was, we had a young man come to a youth meeting that uh, thought Jesus Christ, he had never been in church, he had never heard the gospel, he had never read the Bible, no one had ever told him. He thought Jesus Christ was a cuss word. Literally. Thought Jesus Christ was cussed for. And when I shared with him this, these verses on Monday morning of our first week at camp, he got saved and gloriously saved because he realized that he was lost. So all men are lost. Now you have to explain the verses a little bit. So I'm going to explain them to you so you will know how to explain to someone else, okay? So, for all have sinned. That word all, does that mean you? Now you're looking at this person. I want you to... Okay, let's pretend you're talking with this person one-on-one, -on -one, right? That word all, does that mean you? Yes, this means yes, this means no. Uh, all means all. Okay, does that mean me? Does that mean the preacher? Yeah, all means all. For all have sinned. Now, what is sin? Now, you can say that good old uh, uh, Sunday school answer, missing the mark. We all know that, you know, uh, uh, but I, I just like to break it down easy and say, sin is the bad things we do against God, right? So for all have sinned. Have you done bad things against God? Yes, I've done bad things against God. Okay, have you ever lied, steal, cheated, whatever? Okay, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, what in the world does that mean? Now, does anybody know what the world record long jump is? Anybody watch the Olympics? Anybody want to take a guess? Want to take a guess? Come on, come on. Want to take a guess? Uh, you guys are never quiet. Come on. Okay. Want to take a guess? Okay. I'll give you a hint. It's 29 feet. All right? Okay. Now, that would be like from me to those doors. Okay? So, if I was going to earn my way to heaven, or I'm going to jump my... How many of you think I could jump my way to heaven? Okay? What are you laughing at? Okay? I, you can't do it either. Okay? All right? So, but... I'm going to jump my way to heaven. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Uh! Did I make it? Did I make it? No. Okay. But say I go to church every week. <clears throat> Did I make it? No. But you know what? If I give money in the offering, <clears throat> did I make it? No. But what's the number one reason? If I'm a what? Good person. If I'm a good person, surely God would let me into heaven. Did I make it? Why? I fell short. Okay? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means you can't be good enough. You can't earn it. You can't go to church enough. You can't be good enough to do it. You fall short. So for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The next verse is Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin. What's the wage? What's wages? Payment. The payment of our sin is death. In other words, you deserve to die and go to hell because of your sin. And so do I. Now remember, we're talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody, right? Okay? So you deserve to die and go to hell, and so do I. But the free gift of God. Now how many of you received Christmas gifts? Come on, let me see your hands. I mean, how much did you have to how much did you have to pay her to give you that gift? How much did you have to pay her? Nothing, right? Because it's a gift. And gifts are given out of love. Okay? So, for the wages of sin, death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that takes us to the next point. 
The next point is Christ died for you. Christ died for you. And we take them to 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous, who's the righteous? Jesus. For the unrighteous, who's the unrighteous? Us. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. Okay, we can't get to God on our own because of our sin. So He's going to bring us to God. He gave us a gift, and what was that gift? That we might, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In other words, He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price for your sin and my sin, and then He rose again from the grave. Okay, so all men are lost. We all deserve to die and go to hell, but God loved us so much, and because of that, uh, the penalty of our sin is death, and we deserve to die and go to hell, but Christ gave us a gift, and that gift was eternal life. But it's not all on Jesus. We've got to, we've got to repent of our sins, don't we? Acts, you must repent. Acts 3.19. Repent then, and what? What does it say? Repent then, and turn, repent then, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, wiped away. The Bible says cast as far as the east is the west. He wipes them out. He wipes out your sin and my sin. And times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now what does that mean? When I was 18, uh, I went to work for this camp. That's kind of where Karen and I uh, got to know each other. All right. And, uh, and I was working at this camp, and it was a huge camp, 250 acres. I, my job was to mow and, and weed eat and, and repair barns and do whatever they said to do. Well, my boss came to me, and he says, John, we've got a problem. See, there was... There was two rows of cabins. There was a large row of cabins at the top, and then there was a long, windy hill down to the lake, and there was another row of cabins. And uh, in order for the, the sewage from those lower row of cabins to get up, it had to be pumped out. It had to go up this long hill. So they had a pump station about halfway up the hill. And he said, we've got a problem. For the past three days, everything that has been flushed on those lower row of cabins, which was 11 cabins, four toilets each, is in that pump station because the pipe burst and it's, it's, it's just filling up that pump station. And you're the only one short enough to get in there. What a crock that was. Uh, you're the only one short enough to get in there and fix it. And if you don't, we're going to send all the kids home, and, and it, it, nobody will hear the gospel, whatever. Okay, and so I, so I got to that pump station, and we opened the lid, and oh, he was not kidding. Everything that had been flushed was in that pump station. It looked like chocolate pudding okay it was it was pretty bad okay and it smelled pretty bad and so I was yeah I would cry too and uh, and so I looked at that looked at that hole and I said where's the pipe and he goes you're gonna have to get in there and find it so I got in there and I prayed a prayer I said Lord Lord Jesus if you don't make me get my face in this poo, I will serve you the rest of my days. And so I get in, and the, it kept rising and rising and rising and stopped right, right here, and I went, thank you, Jesus. And I reached around, and I was trying to find the pipe. Oh, there it is. And it squished in my hand. It wasn't the pipe. And so I finally found the pipe, and I took the pipe, and I couldn't see it. It was stuff. And uh, I had to put a clamp on it and, 
and 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 attach it. And so I crawled out of that hole, and I was just covered. I mean, just covered. And he put me in the back of his truck. He wouldn't let me sit in the front with him. Uh, put me in the back of his truck, and he took me up to his house, and he said, "Okay, strip down here, and before you're getting in my bathroom, you're gonna we're gonna get the." big chunks off at least, okay? And he hosed me down like this. You know. And he said, now go take a shower. And so I went and took a shower and I scrubbed and I scrubbed and I scrubbed and I came back and he, he went, go take another shower, dude. And so I took another shower and I scrubbed and I scrubbed and I scrubbed and he, he came up and I, I said, okay, am I good? And he, he sniffed me and Go take another shower. And so I finally, after finally, 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 after three showers, I finally became clean. Okay? And as disgusting as that story is, as gross as I was, that's what God thinks of your sin. See, you say, John, it's, it was just a little white lie I told. Pooh. It was just a pencil I stole. Poo. See, sin is that disgusting to the Lord. It's that offensive to Jesus. But He says, Repent therefore that your sins, and turn back that your sins may be wiped out, blotted out, and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. When I took that shower, it was like, Thank you, Jesus. Washing that away. And that's what God does with our sin when we repent. He washes it away. The next point. You must believe. Now that word believe here doesn't mean just understand who Jesus is. It literally means to put your full faith and trust in something. Now I know some of you are sitting in those chairs and I never saw one person sit in that pew and go, Okay, is it, is it going to hold? No, you just had faith, didn't you? You believed that that chair would hold you up. You trusted that that chair would hold you up. In the same way, Jesus, when we put our faith in Christ, we believe that He will take away our sins. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now, that Lord... The word Lord means master ruler. I'm putting my full faith and trust in you. You believe in your, confess with your mouth, Jesus, I want you to be in total control of my life. And you believe, oh, there's that word, believe, I put my full faith and trust in you. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and be saved. In just a few seconds, you have given them five verses to help them know what they need to do in order to accept Christ and to have eternal life. So you make one more transition. One more transition. Are you ready to give your life to Christ? No matter how much you beg and plead and, and, and can't coerce them, They've got a one. But if you've done a good job of explaining the verses and you've shared your heart with them, most generally people will say, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life to Christ. Well, we do that through prayer. You know, uh, I mean, through faith. You notice I didn't say prayer. I shouldn't say prayer. Uh, because prayer is just talking to God. It's, it's the attitude of the heart. These, what I'm going to share with you are not in the Scripture. They're not magic words, abracadabra. I'm saved, right? It, we receive Christ through faith, okay? So it's that to the heart. But prayer is expressed. Uh, faith is expressed through prayer. And you need to pr have them pray this. And I always encourage them to pray out loud. And you know why I have them pray out loud? So I know that they meant what they said. They prayed the prayer. But, once again, this has got to be an attitude of the heart. They can say these words and slip right into hell. But if they truly mean it, then they can be saved. I know I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry. 
Because what you're recognizing then, you're recognizing your sin, according to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I know I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Thank you for dying for my sin. Because you're recognizing 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Thank you for dying for my sin. Please come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And that's Romans, straight out of Romans 10, 9, 10. Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. And then finally, I will follow you. I will follow you. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what, what, what must I do to be saved? And what did he say? He said, follow the commandments. And he goes, I've done these ever since. He says, one thing you lack. And he saw the riches, he saw his money, he saw that he was holding on to something. He said, sell everything you have and come follow me. And that's what Jesus is looking for people to follow him. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bowed and every eye closed. In just a few minutes, I share with you how you can lead someone to Christ. How you can know that your sins are forgiven and how you can lead someone into that eternal salvation. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, I wonder how many of you in this room would say, you know what? I've never prayed a prayer like that. I've never given my heart to Jesus. I've never repented of my sin and asked Christ to forgive me. And if I were to die tonight, according to the Scripture... I would spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And I realize that, John, because of what you just said. Would you pray for me that I would have the courage to give my life to Jesus right now, right here? I'm not going to embarrass you or point you out. I just want to pray for you. How many of you would say, John, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure that my sins are forgiven. But I would like to know today... Would you pray for me that I would give my, have the courage to give my life to Jesus? Just slip up your hand. Anyone in the room? I'm looking all over. For those of you that are here and are believers in Christ, as I was sharing this story about how to lead someone to Christ, I wonder, did someone come to your mind? Did someone come to your mind that said, I need to share this with this person. I need to have the courage to open up and share my testimony with this person. I pray that you will do that. I pray that you'll have the courage to stand up and share and break the ice. Father in heaven, we come to you now and we just thank you and praise you for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to open up the scriptures, share how we accepted Christ, and lead someone to the Lord. Father, I pray that we will open our eyes, open our ears, and open our heart. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? As we sing this song, if God spoke to your heart, maybe you need to come down and confess your sin and, and confess that I haven't been the kind of believer that God wants me to be. If you'd like to talk to me, I'm here for you. Karen's here for you. You do what God tells you to do. Let's sing.
thank you. We thank you for this time we've had together. We thank you that we were here, that we can praise you, we can worship you, and we can learn from your words. We pray that you'll place those people who need you in front of us, help us to witness to them, help them to talk with them about you. We ask that you bless each one here, as we go to our respective homes, that you might guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.